Welcome, everyone, to the speaker event of the Center for Spatial Business of this academic year. I'm Jim Pick, director of the Center for Spatial Business. I'll introduce our speaker shortly. I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the Center for Spatial Business uh, before proceeding um, to introduce our speaker. The Center for Spatial Business uh, was founded in 2011, and it seeks to develop knowledge and thought leadership about location analytics and its applications in business for researchers, practitioners, students, and the community at large. The areas that the center is concerned about, um, increasing the level of spatial thinking and GIS in business programs at the University of Redlands and other schools of business, providing training towards accomplishing excellence in teaching pedagogical and curricular aspects of spatial business, expanding current research initiatives and projects on spatial business and location analytics at the University of Redlands and in collaboration with other universities developing networks of collaborative partnerships and projects with other universities, businesses, and organizations. I also wanted to mention um, our next speaker event, which will be on February 10th, and we're very pleased to have a panel event uh, on how businesses leverage GIS and location intelligence to create knowledge of markets, placemaking for the future. And we're very pleased to have uh, two panelists, David Bites, co-founder and partner of Plan Grocery, and Paris Williams Allen, GIS and research analyst at Transwestern, which is a large commercial real estate company. Uh, this event will also be from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, the event link will be provided to attendees after you RSVP. Uh, we'll be again uh, promoting and marketing this event and uh, if you particularly needed to get an invitation just you can email me at my university uh, address so i want to now um, proceed um, with great pleasure and introduce just dr joseph kursky to the Center's Invited Speaker Series. Joseph Kursky is a geographer at ESRI with a focus on the use of GIS in education. Uh, Joseph has given two TED Talks on the whys of where. He has served as a geographer in diverse sectors of society, including a governmental 21 years at NOAA, the U.S. Census Bureau, the U.S. Geological Survey, He's been in academia at Penn State and the University of Denver, among others. He's also been an education manager for ESRI for 15 years and further serves as president of the National Council for Geographic Education. Uh, Joseph holds a PhD in geography from the University of Colorado, a master's in geography from the University of Kansas, and a BA in geography from the University of Colorado. He has authored over 75 chapters and articles on GIS, government, and education, and authored eight books. Uh, and I uh, don't want to spend time going over all of those titles right now, but he's had diverse publications. Uh, he has also created 5,000 videos, and he writes columns such as Geo Inspirations for Directions magazine and for other publications. He presents a monthly Thinking Spatially podcast. Uh, as a lifelong learner, Joseph feels as though he's get, just getting started and just actively seeks mentors, partnerships, and, collabor and collaborators. I've known Joseph and have the highest regard for him for many years. I've heard that he's becoming a legendary figure at ESRI. Finally, I found out recently he's also talented at the ukulele. 
So uh, we're very pleased uh, to, to introduce Joseph Kursky. Well, thank well, you, Dr. Pick. Much appreciated. Appreciate the kind words. Greetings. Location analytics and business is our focus for this evening. Why, how, and challenges. Let me ask you something. What do you want to see in society? As you consider your own future at the University of Redlands or wherever you happen to be this evening, and considering the role that you have as change agent in society, I submit to you all that this is an important question to ask. We are living in truly amazing times, aren't we? We have never before been so empowered by some of the tools and data sets that we'll talk about this evening, and yet so challenged as over the past year, seemingly one natural hazard after another, an ongoing and perplexing health crisis, political and social instability, and germane to our discussion this evening, subsequent impacts on business and the economic sector have clearly demonstrated. I submit to you all that location analytics can help you achieve your personal and professional goals and help achieve a prosperous economy and sustainable environment. In other words, a more resilient, healthier, happier future. So my goal for the next four hours, just kidding, we don't have four hours, is to do the following, enable you to understand the technological and societal forces behind the rise of location analytics, starting with but not ending with education, and secondly, to empower you to use location analytics tools, give you some con concrete things that you can actually do from this moment forward, spatial thinking and spatial data in your instruction, research, and in your own career path. And I am going to just say at the outset, because you are the spatial speakers attendees, I know you wanna dig deeper. And therefore, I am going to put in the chat box here, a link to the actual presentation that I'm giving right now. Maybe Dr. Pick could do that. The point is, this whole presentation has far more content than I'm going to be able to deliver in the short time that we have together this evening. But I wanted to provide some additional information so that you can actually go through this story map, we'll talk about story maps in a bit, to go further, okay? Now, Dr. Pick was very gracious to talk about my career path, and I'm just going to briefly mention some of these uh, aspects, not to bore you to tears, but to think about the following. First of all, that you can have multiple toes in different waters. In my case, nonprofit, academia, industry, and um, federal agencies. And secondly, to encourage you that you can change your pathway going forward, especially armed with geospatial technologies and spatial thinking, because it is in demand in a wide variety of sectors of society. The whys of where questions are not going to go away, are they? People are always going to be asked that, those questions and, and delving into those, those issues. The technology will continue to evolve. The tools will continue to be more powerful and easier to use as we go forward, as we'll talk about. Do do a number of uh, forces, but the whys of where questions are going to be continue to be asked and investigated. It's no longer going to be what we had in the past. Oh, GIS, location analytics, yeah, go down the hall and to the right. If you need a map or some spatial data, go see those people. They're they're funny people, but they're they're nice and they'll give you what you need. No, it's not it's not going to be that way anymore. It's going to be pervasive throughout an organization. It's going to be valued throughout an organization. Now we still need, thanks, Louise. We still need to do some adv advocacy. We still need to have our elevator speech down, as I'll talk about in a bit, but it is going to be more and more connected to organizational practice and connected to larger IT trends that we'll talk about here in a bit. Now, I don't intend for this evening's 
uh, presentation to be the end all be all and okay, go forth and think spatially and you know live long and prosper. I fully intend to have a conversation with you all or all y'all as they say in Texas, ustedes, vu, tu, but you all are going forward after this evening. Okay, so feel free to connect with me. Dr. Pick very graciously talked about, okay, it's slightly geeky, but all of these uh, videos that I have on the Our Earth channel uh, I have this Thinking Spatially podcast that uh, comes out monthly. Last month was on uh, geoliteracy. I have the Geo Inspirations column, which is a combination of text and podcasts to give you a sense of, wow, there's a diversity of fields that are all concerned with thinking spatially, and there's a diversity of people involved with those fields. So I hope this is, as the name implies, inspiring to you. Also. We're going to talk about this more this evening, but I'm very keen on helping people to be critical of data, data in our data-rich world and all of its implications. More about that in a bit. Okay, so feel free to connect with me, LinkedIn, etc. Okay, X number of decades ago, I was making maps as, as a young person, as a grade school, junior high, senior high, a teenager. These are the kind of maps that I made. They're all made up in my mind. Um, and they had, as you can see, railroad yards, parks, colleges, ports. They also had, what is this in the, in the right side of this margin here, these numbers? They're address ranges. This is the 3500 block, that's the 4200 block, and it's seven blocks north of the 3500 block. What kid cares about address ranges? Well, I did, and I want, to share that with you because I want you to think about maybe some of the things that you enjoy doing that are outside of what your circle of friends or even family members like to do. Embrace those things. It's okay to have those unique roles and those unique interests. Okay, some things haven't changed. I still love maps, even lying on big maps. My right hand there is pointing at, since we're all about space and place, the location where I am right now, and that is uh, Front Range, Denver, Metro, Colorado. Now, the team that I'm on is at ESRI, Environmental Systems Research Institute, and we have a team that is completely and totally dedicated to helping you all be successful with geospatial technologies and spatial thinking. Faculty, deans, department heads, students, campus facility managers, etc. okay? So think of us as your industry partner. When you go to our website, first of all, our trifold goal is education, sustainability, and science. That hasn't changed since ESRI was founded in 1969 in your very own community. And our team is working in conjunction with you all as your industry partner. We're not just, you know, you go to our education zone on ESRI.com and there's a bot that comes up that says, may I help you? You know, those, those aren't real, right? Those aren't real people when you see those on websites by and large. We are real people, and we are all actually very dedicated to, many of us actually teach, as I do, in universities sort of on the side um, to keep in touch with students and faculty and what their needs are. But it's a dialogue, and we're in it for the long term. We've been, we, the education team, has been around since 1992. And again, we are very much supportive of the good things that you folks are doing. Also, I just want to impart to you students that are sort of maybe getting into geospatial technology, this is a technology that you can feel good about. It's being used by the Nature Conservancy, by the California DNR, by the Jane Goodall Elephant Foundation, and, and so, Trust for Public Land, and onto your local government, onto your university campus, by your, your campus facility people, and your instructors, of course, in the School of Business and uh, in the Spatial uh, Analysis uh, Department as well. So it is being used for good. It really is helping us build a more prosperous, sustainable, resilient future that we are all seeking. And I would also just mention here that you students thinking about what pathway do you want to go down, please keep us in mind. Don't just have us in your, I want to work for ESRI and nobody else, ha you know, spread a fairly broad net. We also have business partners. We have about 300 business partners ranging from, for example, Earthviews. They have a market niche where they sell river, pond, lake data 
above the surface of the water and then also cameras underneath the surface of the water to municipalities to monitor their their um, urban waters. So we have some really interesting business partners. Hey, I, I'd like to work for Earthviews. You know, every day you're out there on your kayak or your canoe gathering data. Then in the afternoons, you're you're uh, analyzing that data and, and processing it. Pretty cool. But anyway, there's a lot of business partners that are doing fascinating things. So um, keep, keep those in mind also. You students out there, we have uh, internships and we have other opportunities. GIS continues to grow. And so we are still actually hiring. So please keep us in mind. We need brilliant people like, like all of the attendees here on the uh, webinar tonight. Now, you students at the university, you selected a wonderful a place to study. I've been working with the University of Redlands for 20 years now. I have great respect for Abhijit Sakhar, Thomas Horan, Dave Smith, Stephen Moore, Mark Kumler, Jim Pick. I, I work with hundreds of universities around the world, and I have to say that these folks that are on the, hopefully are all on the webinar tonight, but you probably should be connected with, if you're not connected with them already, you students at the university, uh, they are not only among my favorite and most innovative colleagues, but they're genuinely kind and caring people. And ultimately, that's what I will remember from our long collaborative efforts. So again, I appreciate you all for inviting me this evening. Those attending this evening from outside the University of Redlands, no matter where you are or your organization or your background, uh, my goal is to encourage you and challenge you in this pathway forward that we're all ablazing together. Okay, so I submit to you all that these forces right here are ones to think about. They're my own five forces that are acting to advance the cause and the use of location analytics. They're not maybe your five. It's kind of like anything you see on the web. The five coolest places to visit in California before you die. The, the five coolest bands of all time, right? This is my own list based on, you know, working in this field for quite a few decades. But I just submit to you all that geo-awareness, people aware of issues that you and I care about, climate, population change, land use, natural hazards, energy, water, social inequities, et cetera, um, are topics of everyday conversation that you hear in stairwells, airport terminals, uh, you know, bus stops, et cetera. They're the topics of every everyday conversation. And so I think that actually is a good thing for our community for some reasons that I'll talk about in a bit. Geo enablement. You know, I used to say, hey, have you used a location app for your fitness, your walks, your runs, your bicycle rides? Or have you used a, um, a mapping application to find the nearest public library or your grandmother's house or way across campus? Now, um, you know, unfortunately it took a crisis, but everybody on the planet with a computer or a phone has seen the JHU coronavirus dashboard, right? Because people used it and continue to use it to make decisions about their everyday activities and municipalities use it. And thousands of hubs and other data portals and dashboards have been set up over the last year showing that this is actually relevant to our everyday life. So people are enabled to use geotechnologies as never before. The geotechnologies themselves having advanced into the cloud is a huge paradigm shift. Some of us remember the clunky days of media and storage and we never had enough graphics on our computers and all kinds of tech barriers. I'm not gonna say there are no tech barriers in learning geospatial technology now. It is a system still. And just to share a personal story, I was in a criminal justice class not too long ago, and about halfway through me teaching one unit using ArcGIS Online with the criminal justice students, they started looking at each other, and I finally said, well, what's going on, folks? Uh, I'm sensing a bad void here. And they said, well, Joseph, we, we thought we were going to learn GIS today, you know, in 90 minutes. Uh, okay, I said, well, this is like chemistry or any other worthwhile endeavor. It's a lifelong endeavor. That said, it is much more accessible than it was just a short time ago because of these trends acting. And the biggest one, I think, is data services in the cloud, GIS as a software, as a service, uh, as a platform that you can build on, etc. Citizen science has been around for 150 years-ish, right, going back to the Audubon Society and people identifying bird feathers and the bird song and the type of tree that the bird was in and so on. And so people have been gathering data like that in paper form and submitting it. But now with the advent of citizen science tools like iNaturalist and uh, Survey123, they can, they can map those and analyze and make decisions. I always say and because oftentimes people 
send me links to their maps and apps and they say, Joseph, I've got my, I got my data on the map now. Great. And I always say and. And the reason why is because I know you were going to tweet this out. Joseph said the map is not the end goal. The map is not the end goal. Understanding something in a deeper, richer way is the end goal, right? And then making decisions on that newfound information. Getting stuff on the map is, is, a, is a reasonable and logical step because much of the things that we want to analyze have a spatial pattern or lack of pattern. But the map is not the end goal. Yeah, we love the technology. Yes, it's great that you can you know, get these tools on your tool belt and have a, uh, a, a better chance of getting a, a truly fulfilling career path. But the end goal is, again, to make a better world. Storytelling. I'm using a story map right here, as you can see, to tell the story tonight of the advent and the advance of location analytics in business and beyond. So the whole idea of storytelling with maps is not a new one, but there are over 1.75 million story maps now in existence, showing that, okay, sure, a varying quality, but it shows the power of mapping. Maps as analytical tools, right? Not just maps as location reference documents. Where is Yemen? Where is Redlands? Where is California, right? Maps are far more than just where things are, but they're why things are where they are, and how can we make a better world with this newfound location information. One of the things that's exciting to me is the connection increasingly of geospatial technology with mainstream IT trends. So for example, we've got tools like the Wayback imagery, which some of you may have looked at. You can see on the left side here, I've got some 2020 imagery, and on the right side, I've got 2014 imagery. Now, this is all terabyte loads of high-resolution satellite imagery that's served in the water balance and, in this case, the Wayback Imagery app. And to dig deeper, you can, in the upper left, take those layers and bring them into ArcGIS Online and bring them into ArcGIS Pro for further analysis, looking at how much of the terrain is now urbanized versus in 2014, or how much water has decreased from, uh, let's say, uh, Lake Mead. So having this connected to the Internet of Things, a really powerful paradigm shifting sort of a moment. Uh, another one is this Water Balance app. So this is all part of the living atlas of the world. Part of the forces I was talking about was the whole advent of geospatial technology to the cloud and having these data services you know, when I was at all those federal agencies for so many years, I always dreamed about, and so did my colleagues, of having, remember Geospatial One Stop? We always dreamed, you know, that was a modest, you know, advance, but, but the living atlas of the world, a, a curated depository of spatial information that's at your fingertips that people can use, I think is hugely powerful. And so with the Water Balance app, for example, it's an illustration of a part of the living atlas, 8,500 data layers, metadata rich. I never metadata I didn't like. That was a little geo pun, making sure you folks were with me this evening. Anyway, the point is, I can go to apps like this that are connected to sense the sensor network. And oftentimes that data is in real time or near real time. So with the water balance app, I could, even if I'm an instructor not teaching GIS per se, but if I'm teaching physical geography or climatology and I can say, oh gosh, you know, in the Amazon, it's not a, a summer and winter, it's a wet season and a dry season. So I can get this, this data showing me clearly that October, November is the dry season and March, April is the wet season. And of course I can change it to uh, Southern Libya and say, oh, well, there are certain months of the year where there's absolutely no precipitation. And what's it like near me? And where do I get the data from? And can I export this? Oh, look, I can export this data as a CSV and then bring it into uh, my GIS for further analysis. This is really exciting to me. I hope you folks are, are with me on this. Location, location, location. What's where, why is it there, and why should we care? I like to think of geospatial analysis in those three phrases. What's where, why is it there, and then why should we care? Even the El Cheapo laundry thinks carefully about where to locate. Uh, in the not too distant past, when I was visiting about 30 to 35 campuses a year, uh, this was one of the 
classic photos on one of those trips about uh, 11 months ago before the travel kind of came to a halt, hopefully just temporarily. Now, location analytics, geospatial technologies, geographic information systems, geomatics, these are all you know, synonyms really for the same thing, looking at patterns, relationships, uncovering trends with the geographic perspective. I would submit to you all that there are four components of location analytics, tools, data, increasingly as services, which is again, paradigm shifting moment, communications slash networks slash people. I think you students will find beyond the University of Redlands fine faculty that I was identifying earlier, that the geospatial community is a very nurturing, caring community. They are all about sharing and sharing knowledge and helping people to grow uh, personally and professionally. There's, there's something really spatial, really special about the geospatial community. So that communications network people component of location analytics, I think, is, is the mem most memorable component. But the last one, of course, is analytical methods. Now, that all being said, though, OK, what tools are most relevant that we're talking about here, Joseph? Well, these are just a few of them. And I'm not going to be focused on tools this evening. But business analyst web, you know, low hanging fruit. You've got competitor information. You've got chain information, locations of businesses, consumer preferences. Who has more than two dogs and two cats? Or who goes and takes their pet to the uh, vet every six months and so on. You, you get, you're getting really fine grained detail. Who's, who buys di a diet iced tea? Who, who, who purchases lottery tickets? Who exercises more than three times a week? All that kind of stuff is at your fingertips in there, along with tools that allow you to create reports, infographics, dashboards, story maps. And that's why the cloud and the platform is so important because all these pieces are connected. It's not just, you know, Joseph's little tool over here on his server somewhere hiding in the corner of his office. It's actually part of this whole platform. Uh, ArcGIS Insights, ArcGIS Online, a lot of business schools using Pro, including the R Bridge. But remember, now what is this? Some of you that have been around a while, you might recognize what this is. What is this? Do we have a chat box? What is this, folks? It's an old Mac. What is it used for now? I took this in an actual high school, uh, teaching an after school program in uh, G GIS for high school students. It's, uh, it's now a doorstop. Now, at one time, it was a valued piece in someone's computer architecture. Now, think of the devices that you hold near and dear. They're probably too light to be a doorstop. Now, they're probably going to be a paperweight. At not, it's, it's somewhere in the not too distant future. The point I'm making here, folks, is that the most important tool is your brain. So that's why I'm focusing this evening on spatial thinking. The tools will change. The tools will evolve. We're always going to be asking a proximity kind of tool, a, 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 an intersection kind of tool. And, and also, we're going to need tools that we're not even asking questions uh, about yet that we need to develop in the future. So don't get too locked into, I've got to figure out where that tool is on the toolbox. The tools are useful, but it's your brain, your spatially enabled thinking brain that is the most important one for you to keep nurturing as we go forward, okay? Now, why location analytics in business? Uh, location, 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 right? A couple of points here to share with you all. Businesses exist to add value, correct? Location is vital to all aspects of business. Hence, location analytics adds value to business decision making. As I mentioned, and as Luis put in the chat box earlier, this presentation contains links to videos, to um, articles. For example, my colleague uh, Helen Thompson just last week wrote this very good article in Forbes about the rise of location in advanced analytics. And one of the things that Helen talked about is that the need to understand the power of location data is creating this new type of business analyst. Um, as the, we talked about, the digitization of information has accelerated, yielding massive amounts of data in the truly big data world. Corporations, companies, et cetera, have discovered that almost every data set contains some sort of geographic insights, if we can only pick out those insights and discover those relationships. And so um, location is becoming increasingly valued by organizations. For example, how to analyze and adjust supply chains, 
for efficiency and sustainability, how to determine the optimal route for deliveries, services, sales, and uh, stay agile in this era of rapid change, and how to analyze changing demographics to decide whether to expand or and how to expand operations and provide services that better support the community and customers. So location intelligence is becoming increasingly used and increasingly valued. How common is how common is it in schools of business? We'll talk about that in a minute. I submit to you all though that location analytics needs to be taught in higher education schools of business. And that's one of the reasons why I have such respect for you folks at the University of Redlands. You're not completely alone in this. There are some other universities that my team and in conjunction with all of you in higher education are trying to <laughs> blow on the embers to get some sort of location analytics sparks flaming. So we basically tap on all the windows and doors that we can to help people to realize that A, this is important, it's not going away, and B, there are some fairly accessible ways of doing this for the faculty and for the students. You know, in the not too distant past, it was sort of like this, hey, you need to learn some GIS, here's a set of manuals. And, and here's some data and, and we'll see you in you know 12 or 18 months or something like that. Now I'm exaggerating a bit to make a point. It's still a system, There's still, it's still a lifelong endeavor, but it's much more accessible, for example, to school, a school of business than it was in the past. And so my hope is that people in data science, business, economics, other departments on campus, civil engineering, et cetera, will say no longer, oh, GIS, spatial analytics, that's over in the geography department. That's over in environmental studies or geology or some sort of enviro geo department. Now that's, you know, that's my roots and I'm not gonna ignore my own, you know, roots. They're good people, but I don't want it to be, I think that GIS is too valuable just to be on one department in a campus. I really do. I think it's, it needs to be spread in some capacity in health and in other fields. Now, I believe that location analytics and business education enables these things. Your university be, to be innovative, students to be competitive, your school of business to be competitive. It's, it's a competitive world out there in academia and beyond, right? It's not just in business, but academia as well, especially in these disruptive educational and societal times, right? You gotta think about, universities have to think about how are we going to be viable going forward to 2030? And this is one way for them to show that, okay, we're seizing, we're, we're seizing the future. Mm -hmm. And your university to demonstrate that your students are employable. Now, there are lots of ways in schools of business where location analytics is used. These are just a few, as you can see right here. I'm not gonna list them all for you, but you can see as well as I do. Uh, some universities focus on supply chain management. I've got an article um, that um, I wrote in conjunction with good faculty like you all uh, last year that talks about, okay, where are, let's take five university, oh heavens, five university schools of business and um, University of Redlands, James Madison University using supply chain management, Arizona State University focusing on information systems and, and elsewhere. So not every university focuses on the same thing, which is good, but they're all realizing the value of this. Now, who's, who hires students with location analytics skills? These are a couple of things that I'd like you to click on when you get this, when you look at this uh, story map of mine, because they're, I selected them because they're all different. They're all looking at a different paradigm than maybe <clears throat> has happened in the past with them. So for example, Ford, it's a different world, right? Than it was five, 10, 15 years ago. There's actually declining personal car ownership. So how does Ford, deal with that and how do they use location analytics uh, clothing companies like fruit of the loom they've got merchandising concerns they've got a global network of of suppliers and manufacturers how do they get all that stuff to market and then market it and more and then john deere about agricultural equipment and some other things so um take a look at these they're really compelling oh hi sir uh, if i could just briefly break in uh, we are opening up the chat for the Q&A session that will start in 15 minutes, uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Ab Abhijit Sarkar, last year's center director. So the chat 
is being opened, and please put your questions in there, which will be relayed in the Q&A in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thanks for the warning. Thanks. I thought we had four hours. Just kidding. Now, again, thinking about what I was mentioning earlier about that this tool is the most important, I just say to you students, it's okay to specialize in some aspect. I know many of you are in business, but some of you are in other fields. Whatever field you're in, it's okay to specialize. But the value, I think, in what we're talking about this evening is still this holistic view of the world that it's a world of systems it's the carbon cycle it's the atmosphere the lithosphere the the biosphere the anthrosphere you know the human sphere and so on all those systems working together there's you, you've got to be a systems thinker right tweaking or adjusting or modifying this variable over space and time could affect something over here so don't lose that spatial holistic view of of the world that was pretty common in the 19th century and not that I'm, you know, hearkening back to the days before we had all these wonderful data sets and tools at our fingertips, but we've lost some of that in our maybe overemphasis on specialization. So keep the holistic view and also specialize, okay? Another thing that I think bears mention here this evening is that lot, we've got multiple things changing at the same time, don't we? We've got the society changing, people's needs changing, how they look at businesses changing, and so on. One of the things that's exciting, I think, you know, as a geographer, and I hope this resonates with you all, is there's increasingly corporate social responsibility, or CSR, right? You probably heard this mentioned in the past, perhaps at the University of Redlands. It's now a vital part of a company's brand and, and a metric by which consumers gauge the company's standing as a good corporate citizen. Now, I'm very proud to be part of ESRI. We were, I would, without bragging too much and about our organization, Jack Dangerman has always been, and it pervades throughout the organization, a, someone that wanted to do good for the planet from a business perspective. And so that's why I showed the Jack Dangerman Preserve out to the west of you, University of Redlands folks, uh, and other examples. Um, and there are other companies doing that same thing. And if they're not now, they will be shortly because the CSR is not going away. We've got a finite, limited set of many of our natural resources, if not all of them. They're not infinite. So we need to be good stewards and that affects your work in business. Okay, so that is changing, but also GIS is changing. I'd like you to think about the following. In the past, GIS was sort of a desktop niche sort of a tool and I and my teammates are wanting to get folks thinking, okay, out of thinking, okay, I need to learn GIS, I need to learn ArcGIS Pro 2.6 or, or whatever. It's not learning software X version Y. It is, yeah, you have to choose some tools to use. And I always say, choose the most appropriate tool for the job for one thing, but also again, don't just focus on the on the tools. Think about GIS as this platform software as a service enabled environment. It is tied to major IT developments as I talked about briefly earlier with IoT, also artificial intelligence which we'll talk about here in a bit. And it's also tied to these societal issues. Location privacy, why does that app ask me my location? Do I always say yes when it asks me? And if I do, does it matter? Or I'm using, I'm creating a story map, do I have just because a, a, an image is online, do I have the rights to use it in my story map? You know, there's all kinds of interesting teachable moments for you, you that are instructors out there uh, when you're using, when you're teaching with GIS. People sometimes say uh, to me and others in GIS education, you're just pushing the tools. It's never been about pushing the tools or just focusing on the tools. If you're learning about proximity and you use an example from uh, earthquakes, okay, how many earthquakes are within X distance of the San Andreas Fault, how many tornadoes are within X distance of Oklahoma City, and so on, you're learning about those hazards. You're not just learning about the proximity tool, you're learning about spatial patterns, relationships, trends, in the case of tornadoes, about air fronts and air masses and the jet stream and proximity to coasts and vulnerable po populations and cities and so on, right? You're always learning it in context. You're never just learning 
the tools. Conversely, there are more and more instructors that are using GIS as a tool to teach environmental studies or history or even humanities. Um, and again, they're not just learning those contextual situations, they're also learning a bit of geospatial technology. So it's, 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 a, it's a meshing, it's both. It's not this or that. What I'd like to focus on here is um, the following. If we think about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, GeoAI, machine learning, this is also impacting GIS in a major way. And the reason why I say that is that most competitive organizations are making uh, strategic investments in artificial intelligence, as you probably know especially machine learning, using location data. Here's something you may not know because it's not often highlighted in these articles. Location data as the, like the connective thread to automate processes, improve predictive modeling, and gain business ex uh, advantages. And these organizations are already using location analytics to uncover these patterns, gain insights, and create a competitive edge. And because of that, I just wanted to focus on this example. Think about the ways that we started with geospatial technology. For you undergraduate students, for example, this may be something that you've actually read in a textbook. But the point is, with these tools, when it was first starting, what we would do, for example, if we took a, um, an issue like traffic accidents, what we would do is the following. We would make some graphs. Uh, we would map things, for example, in this county in Florida, uh, in, we do oftentimes have a lot of data that we'd have to sling around and we would make maps that um, in a GIS were sort of replicating what we used to do with paper maps or maps on film or copper plates in the not too distant past really. Um, and, and because of that, we would end up with stuff like this. It's a bit difficult to pick out patterns, relationships and trends. So GIS in its early days was sort of replicating what we did with paper and film in digital mode. Now, it's I think it's it's phase two of geospatial technology where we can do something like this, where we can say, hey, we can look at statistical hotspots of, in this case, accidents, which is a very serious issue, right? You may have know you may know some family members or friends impacted by this very serious issue, um, and so as as most projects have, you have a finite budget. You have a finite staff, you have deadlines and so on. And so being able to do this, where you're making, for example, hexagons, and then you are picking out the statistically significant, consistent hotspots. And those are the ones that you're gonna focus on because of your limitations in staff, budget, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that you can do that illustrate that GIS is moving into this different realm. It's no longer just replicating what we did before, it is getting, gaining new insights because we can map and analyze things in new ways, okay? That's the idea behind uh, this particular illustration with these, with, these, with these hot spots that we can extrude above the surface. Now we all love the tools and it's fun to try new things like this, but again, I say, do it if it adds value. Don't 3D eyes, don't hexagon eyes your data just because the tools are there. Do it if it actually adds value like it did for these uh, particular um, hot spots. Now I mentioned this earlier, but despite the trends that I talked about, the forces that I talked about earlier, that uh, there's a rising amount of geo-awareness, I think you still need your elevator speech. So on that YouTube, Our Earth channel, I actually have, this is pretty geeky, I realize, I actually have about 15 elevator speeches about, in my case, why GIS and education matters. You need to have your own elevator speech down because someone will come into your office, your cubicle at some point, or online, and say, hey, you've got 30 seconds to talk to the dean or talk to your, your board of directors or talk to the CEO or your city manager or you've got one minute or you've got five minutes. So have, have multiple lengths of your elevator speech down about why what you're doing matters and what value does it bring to your organization. Here's another illustration in our closing minutes here. Another change that AI, machine learning, big data is bringing. Picture your typical street scene and picture a vehicle moving down that street. What if from that video, from an ordinary video, it could capture all those light poles, all those tree species, all those plants, the condition of the pavement, the condition of the storefronts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So 
what if that data could be automatically captured? It's going to transform, for one thing, all those entry-level GIS technician jobs because they won't have to be gathering that data. It will be there. Their job is going to be to curate, to sort out the, the good from the not-so-good data and so on. And what the things that I'm talking about right now, for example, that, um, that video going down the street of a community, and things like the Locate XT, XT tool, which takes unstructured data, picture a, a PDF or a bunch of documents from your city government or, or some report, an archeological report from 1890, but it's got some location information. The Locate XT tool takes the, the positions that are listed in that report and creates mappable data from it. So I'm not talking about, you know, this would be great if we had it someday. These tools are actually available now. Okay, so it's exciting times. Okay, so let's get practical. First of all, I do have a definition. I saw that chat um, note, so thanks for that. I do have a definition of spatial thinking in the GeoNet space. So my definition of spatial thinking has to do with looking at change over space and time, looking at things holistically, geographically, looking at trends and relationships. And if you want the full definition, I can pull it up when we get to the chat of the Q&A. But it, it is on GeoNet. If you just look at my last name, Kursky, definition of spatial thinking, GeoNet, you'll find it. So thanks. OK, how can you actually do this? This sounds interesting, Joseph. And maybe I'm not at the University of Redlands where they fully embrace this already. How can you embrace the wise of where paradigm in your own you faculty, you in, your instruction? Well, there are ways that you can do this effectively in the classroom, virtually or face to face, which I've got right here. You can use existing data, existing lessons. You can create your own. And I'll talk more practically about that in a moment. Here's some of the advice, though, on teaching with GIS. Don't get too locked into the step by step like we used to have to do. That's all the students had in the past. There wasn't help files. There weren't videos. There weren't how to's. You had to build all that into your lessons. And I'm not telling you anything that isn't difficult for me as well. I have lots of long lessons, 40 page lessons on how to do X, Y, and Z in a certain lesson on let's say um, routing or hazards or something like that. I'm trying to practice what I'm preaching to you and that is reduce the size of those lessons and really get to the kernels, the, the essence because the students don't read all that stuff anymore. They don't need to because if they get stuck on a certain thing, they can go out to the help files or to a video or something like that. You don't need to embed all that in your lessons. And another thing is because the platform of GIS is changing, you're going to be stuck with this sort of need to curate every quarter when the platform updates. And you don't want to do that. You want to focus on, you know, the things that are more important than updating screenshot A or B. I also submit to you all that if you, this is more to you students, if you develop these fundamental GIS skills, the sky's the limit. You can do anything. And I salute you instructors that just let your students fly because I'm an instructor as well at several different campuses and I know as well as you do that you learn tons from the students and you students fly with this. These 10 things, okay, you might debate some of these, but if you master these, you can do anything with geospatial technology. There's a couple of engaging business applications that I invite you to go through. We don't have time this evening to do that, but I'm gonna to skip to this five ways to keep learning. First of all, we have a business education landing page. And that landing page is something that my colleagues and I created to give you a sort of an entry point into, okay, business analytics uh, with uh, geospatial technology. So that's the business education landing page. We also have a whole library of lessons in the Learn ArcGIS library. And if you search on business as I'm doing here, you'll see those lessons. Again, they're plug and play, the data's there, the lessons are there. And they're not just learning the tools, they're looking at an issue, water quality or uh, citing new franchise location, et cetera. We also have an ESRI Academy. These aren't meant to compete with what the good things that you folks in the universities are doing. They're meant to supplement what the good things that you are doing in the universities and community colleges, technical and tribal colleges are doing. 
uh, I would highly recommend the MOOCs as part of this. They're fun, they're rigorous, they have personality, they're taught by interesting people. So we have a cartography MOOC, we have a MOOC on spatial analysis, earth imagery, uh, one on coding, which is important as we move forward into the web paradigm. Also, I think you know that we have a, our own press that actually, thanks to Jack Dangerman, has been around since 1990-ish, maybe even late 80s. But um, anyway, the point is we have hundreds of titles in there. They're all available digitally through Vital Source, and um, they, are, they, are, they are quite good. So here's a couple of my favorites in here. Also, um, I have my own spatial reserves data blog. This came out of an ESRI press book that Jill Clark and I wrote uh, some years back. But because these issues are still important, we wanted to maintain the, an ongoing discussion with the community. So for example, one of the recent posts was everyday examples of being critical of the data. So again, trying to make this a set of short activities that you instructors can actually use in the classroom. George Mason University, simple Chinese fast food chain. Hmm, that's interesting. I thought George Mason was a major research university. So uh, again, being critical of the data. Is the three stars there or the four stars, the stars for George Mason, or is it a star for the uh, fast food chain that has, happens to be in the student union? <laughs> How about this one? Uh, you're gonna cringe. Orientation matters in maps. Now, to be fair, I did write to this publisher and a couple of my colleagues did too, and they, they did eventually change the orientation, orientation in that um, catalog. I was, doing a, I was writing an article recently with our uh, chief medical officer on the impact of COVID on geography, GIS, and education, and I had to do a search on where is the National Academy of Sciences physically located. And my search results were a house in a cul-de-sac in Denver. Interesting. I thought the National Academy of Sciences <laughs> was in Washington, D.C. Fascinating. Okay, now speaking of the Internet of Things, yeah, we've got these data feeds. Sometimes they're in error. I know it gets hot in Texas, but this is really hot. And it's really wet. It's like Noah's Ark flood. And it's really humid. And it's really windy, as you can see here. The only thing that's normal is the pressure. So this... A couple of examples, some are not even spatial in nature, like this one. I thought it was a pretty big Fab Four fan, but look at these titles. A Day in the Sky, uh, Cans Buy Me Love. That's not even a real song. So be critical of the data. Recognize that geospatial information is powerful, but know how to use it and recognize its limitations. So that is the spatial reserves data blog about offsets and, and data quality. So. You instructors out there, when you're teaching with these tools, I believe you're fostering geoliteracy. You're, you're, you're focusing on content knowledge. You're, you've got some skills that you're embedding in the students, not just geospatial skills, but communication skills, being critical of the data, copyright, privacy, all those. And then wrapping around it is this geographic or spatial perspective. You don't have to be a geographer to infuse the spatial perspective. All right, so final notes here. You students, here are some top skills that I believe are important as you go forward. Be curious, ask questions. Ask questions your professors aren't even asking you. When you get into the workplace, like mine and others, you need to ask questions that your supervisors are not even asking you. Be able to work with data, as I've mentioned several times here. The questions, by the way, and the curiosity will lead you to be tenacious, right? I've got to get this, this project finished. I've got to get it. It's got to be good. You know, so you, you, keep, you keep at it until you get it right. Go outside your comfort zone, whether it's your location and you need to go outside your region or go outside your, your, your country, go international, or maybe and also outside your disciplinary comfort zone. So even if you're at a, if you're at a conference, go into a track that is completely foreign to you that you don't know much about. So I do that as well. And I learn so much from that community that I'm in maybe just for a few hours. Also, ethics. Um, there's a lot of ethics embedded in all of this stuff. And I wish we had more time to go into it. But I've got a couple of uh, blogs on ethics. And for you faculty out there, um, the because of the evolution of these geo-related fields, GIS is changing. Our planet is changing. We've got some perplexing issues, no doubt, that we've got to change and turn the trends around, our 
instructional practice should change with all of these things. You're teaching with a system. There's no one single pathway that I can say to you faculty, this is the way it should be done. I learn a great deal from interacting with you all. And there are multiple pathways, and that's good. You're teaching students how to learn. That is the main thing. And OK, why does this matter? Well, again, students who understand how to think spatially and use location analytics can be a powerful and positive force in the university, their future workplace, and in the global economy. And also, emp empowered with employees who can use location analytics, businesses will become vibrant and efficient, enabling a prosperous economy and sustainable environment for all. And I'm, I'm an optimist, folks. I believe that we've got these skilled, energetic people, you all. We've got some very powerful tools at our fingertips and rich and varied data. We can solve these problems. Admittedly, they are increasingly complex and affecting our everyday lives, but we can do it. And whether you're an educator, a GIS analyst out there, or a student, you have a critical role in shaping the future. Thank you. Questions, comments? Issues? Let me pull up my contact information as a reminder. Thank you, Joseph, very much. Can you hear me okay? Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, excellent talk again. We have a number of questions, so um, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to get to some of those questions right away for you. Um, a number of these questions are coming from students um, from the University of Redlands, several from um, outside as well. So firstly, I want to begin by acknowledging uh, all of you who uh, not only uh, attended the talk tonight, but also have submitted questions. Um, a number of questions come regarding, uh, of course, spatial thinking, and you're very kind to point to your own uh, writings in that area. And uh, regarding what spatial thinking is, I believe you spoke to that, and we can uh, look up your uh, work and your writings more to learn more. Um, uh, here is a question uh, uh, regarding the use of location analytics as a, a platform or as a tool, really, that can be used across, across platforms uh, to provide information to the public uh, regarding COVID and uh, COVID testing. Um, if I am a business student, if uh, you know business students are getting interested in this, how can they leverage geotechnology perhaps across multiple platforms to, um, you know, increase their own level of awareness in their communities about COVID and possibly educate the public? Well, that's a great question. Um, it, it points, first of all, to the advent of geotechnologies into the cloud, because in the past, you know, the way that you would get the word out about your own research, whether it was geospatial or otherwise, is you'd publish in a journal, uh, you give a presentation at a conference, uh, and that was pretty much it. And nothing against those two things. They're still viable means of communicating now. But now you've got the ability to create infographics, dashboards, web maps, web other web mapping applications. You can set up an ArcGIS hub. You can set up an experience builder. But don't just use the tools, but have an objective, right? Why would you do? Why would you pick any of those things to get the uh, the word out about what you're passionate about, whether it's COVID related or, or otherwise? Well, a uh, so that your audience is, is broader, and not just more people, but I think a, a wider diversity of people from different disciplines, which is exactly what we need, in my opinion, to solve these problems. Uh, again, you know, I come from, like many of you, from a geo-environmental background, but I'm increasingly working with schools of business, with data science, pe science people, with digital humanities and elsewhere. And that's exactly what we need to do to be able to grapple with and solve these perplexing problems. But circling back to your, uh, your points and, and questions, there, there is no shortage of, of, let me just show you this. So you've all seen the JHU coronavirus dashboard. Um, I have a, a very short dashboard of my own that I created on something I'm passionate about, and that is walkability. So it uses four pieces of the platform, which I think is hopefully going to be helpful to you um, for this question. Uh, let me briefly just show it. It'll, it'll take me about 30 seconds, if you don't mind. Okay, no, so, no, 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 no. okay, Go ahead. super. 
it's not the end all be all, but it's an illustration of using pieces of this web enabled geospatial technology that we have at our fingertips. So here is my walkability story map. So the story map really is the wrapper that communicates what's walkability, why do we care about it, why do communities care about it, and so on. Inside my story map, I have a survey one, two, three, which asks five simple questions about walkability. Is this place walkable? Where is it? Do you have a photograph? Are there branches? Are there, are there obstructions? Rate the walkability. So here's my survey one, two, three. It's open right now, so actually anybody could contribute to it because I've crowdsourced it and until I, the author, turn it off, you can actually contribute to it. I've got my results in a web map, so that's the third component. So I've got the story map, the web map, and the survey. And the last thing I have here, which is circling to what I was talking about a moment ago, I have an actual dashboard that reflects the result of my survey. Now, the JHU coronavirus dashboard and some of the other ones that you've probably seen have multiple feeds from multiple organizations at multiple scales. Mine is a very simple one that's just getting data from one place, and that is my survey. So here I've got a um, my pie chart of oh, roughly three quarters are, are walkable right now of the 457 that people have submitted in these various places around the world. I've got a little legend here. The point is all this took me to create the dashboards about 45 minutes. The story map took me about an hour. The survey took me about an, an hour and the map took me about a half hour. So in an afternoon, I set up all of these things. So we're not talking days, weeks, months to learn all this stuff. So I think that's just an illustration for how you can communicate. Sure, I have an I have an essay that you saw we me, me originally search for um, that had the original. Okay, what's walkability? Why do I care about it? But really, the way I communicate is not so much with this this essay that's sitting out on GeoNet, but actually I communicate it with with the story map. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's helpful. That these tools are accessible and you can use them effectively. Of course. Uh, let me uh, acknowledge um, uh, Marina Cabrera Mendoza from the University of Redlands who submitted that previous question. Um, let me turn to this very uh, interesting question that uh, certainly I as a faculty can relate to. I'm sure faculty colleagues who are attending tonight from all over will be uh, able to relate to um, uh, business students, right? They have a lot on their plates, uh, namely, you know, they're taking their coursework, there's data science, there's accounting, there's finance project management, that will learn some coding, and then there's geospatial, right? Looking to the future, what would your advice be uh, for, let's say, an MBA student, right? Um, because it seems like a lot of these things, there's already too much to handle, right? And if it's geospatial on top of uh, all of the other disciplinary areas that they're trying to master, what would your recommendation be if, if I'm that MBA student? That's a, you folks, I knew you'd ask me these really hard questions and they, <laughs> these are great. First of all, um, my, let me, my, let me take one quick moment. Uh, this is from an MBA student at Grand Canyon University. Awesome. And, uh, and Kevin Shipman. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, first of all, my philosophy on this, which I hope at least you could sense from my presentation is that I'm always advocating using the most appropriate tool for the job not using it just because it's there. So same thing with geotechnology. Uh, use pieces that are that will help you solve or grapple with or understand a certain problem. You can't, in addition to all the other tools, are um, Power BI, I don't know, other tools that you're using, you can't always put in more. You, something has to go, right? So you have to carefully weigh as a student or a faculty member or anyone really, Okay, what do I, what do I need to, to to learn to move forward and advance in my own pathway? Because geospatial touches on so many aspects because of this whole wise of where thing, I really do think that it is worth dipping a few toes into the waters, even if you don't see a need for it right now, because at some point you're going to encounter the following: the the amount of geospatial analysts, managers those sorts of career positions, they're going to modestly still grow. But more rapid growth is you're going to be a city planner or a, uh, a franchise manager or, or a, uh, an operations supervisor or whatever. And someone will say, do you know how to build a web mapping application that does this? Oh, yeah, I know how to do that. 
it, so it'll be a part of the things that people ask you to do on the job. And so I would start with, well, first of all, I just wanted to say that. But secondly, the things to start with are these web-based, cloud-based uh, pieces, story maps, and spatial analytics in ArcGIS Online or Business Analyst Web, surveys, how to set up a, a simple survey, serve it, gather data from it, and then analyze it. Remember, the map is not the end all that I was talking about earlier. The map is not the end point. Keep going beyond the map. Um, those kinds of things. And the nice thing, to, I think, to speak to what you're maybe feeling a little bit stressed about, oh gosh, you know, I thought I was busy before. Increasingly, these tools are, are being integrated into other things. So for example, um, there are mapping tools in a lot of different business toolkits these days. There's mapping tools in Salesforce you know, which we and many other organizations use to figure out, okay, who are the customers and what's our conversation history with them and what kinds of products do they have and so on and so forth. You know, so increasingly, you're gonna be stumbling across uh, mapping spatial analytics tools inside mainstream business tools. So it's not like you have to set those aside, increasingly they're gonna be integrated, but they're not completely integrated yet. So I still think it's worth dipping some toes into these waters as well. Excellent. Uh, here comes, um, Joseph, I must warn you, is a, what I think is a loaded question from uh, Judy Keefe at the University of Western Ontario, uh, or Jude Keefe, uh, my bad. Uh, Jude, thanks for submitting the question. Uh, and this is a, a pretty interesting situation oftentimes that we see play out in uh, private sector uh, organizations as well. Um, says that um, I'm working as a research assistant for a business school coming fresh from a MA in geography and uh, therefore have the nickname of master of maps as a result in the business school. Um, that doesn't have any spatial methods involved at all. So uh, the task that Jude is working on is mapping a conceptual supply chain into a like a spatial visual to begin analysis of proximity clustering, etc. The struggle, of course, is to explain some of these technical steps in a way that a non-mapping person without the background could replicate the process while it's still being useful to geomatics professionals who might be seeing it. Um, what might be the best way to make GIS sound enticing <laughs> in, in a digital paper trail for future researchers to keep up with the process um, who might be continuing the work um, after Jude? As I said, well, that's a lo loaded question, and oftentimes we see this this dichotomy play out. Oh, sure. And first of all, I salute you. You're in the birthplace of GIS, right? Roger Tomlinson, 1960s yeah. Ontario, Canadian Land Information System. Yeah, so you're in a good place there. Lots of good roots in this. Uh, but secondly, uh, it touches on what I was ever so lightly touching on earlier, and that is you have to have your elevator speech down. Um, what speaks to that audience? I, I, I would argue that a lot of people need to know um, a little bit about geospatial. I, I would say most every discipline needs to know a little bit about it. So when I work with intro, you know, marketing 101 or supply chain 101 students, I don't go into some of the things that a few people need to know a lot about GIS. I don't go into the ellipsoids and datums and, you know, some of that stuff, Krieging. I say, okay, you want to make a map of your competitors. You, here's a core plath, here's how to make a core plath map. Here's how to make an infographic. And as they journey down that path, I inject a little bit more about, okay, how you know classifications matter, whether it's you know equal interval or standard deviation, et cetera. And the projection actually matters if you're doing a, let's say you're expanding up in Sweden, you probably wouldn't want to use a Mercator projection, you know, et cetera. So I there's 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 teachable moments down the down the way, but I start with. And I think this is what you're you're kind of getting at. How do you get folks interested? You know, had we had time tonight, I would have done most of this in a sort of an interactive business analyst web and using actual because uh, tool of uh, geospatial tools because they're so intriguing, right? And you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a map is worth a thousand pictures, right? It's just you almost never meet someone who really hates maps. Now, I was in a workshop one time when someone said, you know, Joseph, I, I, I just really don't get excited by them. Well, I said, well, by the end of the workshop, at least you'll see what maybe what the value is. Right. But most people are kind of, 
they're they're fascinating, really. And so I would say, you know, use some compelling but useful and germane to the topic that you're addressing, the audience that you're working with in your school of business. Um, th that would resonate with what they want to know. So, yeah, when I, you know, work with health folks, I, I don't start with, well, here are the tornado patterns. I think it's fascinating, but okay, Joseph, yeah, let's, let's, let's focus on an area that, that is related to what we're grappling with every day. And fortunately, nowadays, there are really no shortages of, of data and act short activities that would really speak to that audience. Some of us remember the old days where you kind of based a, your your demos, your lessons, your instruction, really even entire courses on where the data was. And so a lot of people in the old days, this isn't such an issue for those of you in Redlands, but a lot of people are like, Joseph, I'm, I'm tired of looking at, you know, pipelines in Redlands and, and parcels in Redlands. That's where the <laughs> that's where a lot of the data was. We had a lesson for years on on a certain, you know, set of census tracts in Atlanta. And it's like, well, okay, that's interesting, but now that's not an issue. Now the, the issue is on the opposite side. How do we sort out with this sea of information what is appropriate for uh, my particular discipline? Okay. Um, let me get to um, these last two questions. I'm going to kind of group them because they're very uh, related and interesting. This one comes from Brian Colson, uh, who is an MBA student uh, in our location analytics concentration in the MBA. Uh, you spoke about elevator pitch, and it's such an important point. Uh, Brian's question and the follow-up that I would ask is also uh, from Christy McEwen. Uh, what do you think is a good method to get leadership within a business organization outside of a GIS team um, for uh, you know an elevator spe uh, uh, speech to understand the advancement of GIS technology and getting it just beyond paper maps? And perhaps a more broader version of the question is, uh, what advice would you have for generalists in a world or in an you know in, in industries that so much value specialists nowadays? Oh gosh, right. I I do, I truly do believe that the holistic. Yeah, generalist. I know that has a bad connotation, doesn't it? Um, mm -hmm. But it's that holistic perspective that I think is so valuable. How do you, yeah, how do you, the, the challenges nowadays are not so much the technical challenges. Where do I get data? Where do I, how do I use location analytics? It's, it's sort of that, that mindset that, that you're, I think you're hinting at that people still think, oh, maps, um, spatial data uh, that doesn't impact me or I've got Google Maps on my phone. You know, why do I need you as a geospatial knowledgeable person? There's still some of that around. Um, and that's in part why, uh, you know, I and, and others are actually working, you know, on the primary and secondary school side, because if we get, you know, people thinking spatially and using these tools, uh, and perspectives, they'll get up to the university and and they won't say, what's geospatial? What's what's location analytics? They'll already know what it is. And then, of course, that transforms what, what you folks have to teach at the university a bit into the future. But uh, yeah, it's it's still a, it's still probably the, the thing that we are grappling with the most. I wish I could tell you that, oh, every every university gets it. They understand the value of all this. You know, they're not bad people if they don't use location analytics. They're just, you know, busy and they've got budgets and they've got sure. staffing yeah. issues and they're trying to reinvent themselves. And, and, and a lot of times it's, it's just unaware or that's over in the geography department. We're good. Um, yeah, I, we should talk more. We should talk more. Exactly. <laughs> it's loaded questions. Jim, I want to take one quick moment, if it's okay. I know we are getting to the close of our times, but we still, we are not losing audience, if I may. Um, important comment from Brett Lucas, and I wanted to acknowledge that and uh, make sure that our students particularly, but we are all hearing that GIS doesn't quite exist in a vacuum, it exists as, as a part of uh, what might be the, the technology uh, stack in, in a company. And many companies, uh, Brett mentions, have a real estate research department, a store research department. And uh, besides 
um, you know, that might be involved with, you know, site selection, sales projections, tracking, competition, etc. Besides GIS, solid knowledge of Excel, pivot tables, data visualization, data blending, these are all essential skills that, that business students uh, particularly uh, uh, should possess. And uh, I wanted to also acknowledge a couple of requests for uh, educational resources coming from faculty colleagues here at the university and co-authors outside uh, Bruce Rodding at the University of Redlands and Nam Chul Shin, who is the department chair at the uh, CSIS department at PACE have asked for your ethics blogs. And also if you have any recommendations about um, intro books um, for uh, GIS that may be not so like techie, but might have startup exercises that could entice uh, business CSIS students to get involved with. So we can maybe perhaps, um, if you'd be so kind, share those with us and then uh, uh, disseminate that information. Indeed, thanks for bringing all those things up. First of all, uh, related to what Brett is mentioning yeah. and also the previous person, these, these several of these videos right that I have in here, these articles mm -hmm. and videos with these companies, sometimes that means more to certain audiences that you can say, well, Ford is doing this, you know, X business is doing this. Sometimes that resonates and they're very short, they're very to the point and um, they don't get into a whole lot of technical detail. So those might be helpful. Uh, second thing though, yes, agreed. This is and, and we're just at baby steps on this stuff, integrating GIS into mainstream business practices and also practices that and tools and methods that you use at the uh, university level. Admittedly, some of these are still, okay, I'm gonna learn my other things and then I'm gonna use some geospatial over here. We're trying to integrate these things. In terms of a, a good resource, one of my favorites is the ARC GIS book. Yes. And it's 10 activities and every single one of, it's part of the Learn GIS library. Every single one of the maps in every one of these 10 activities is clickable. And each one has a few sentences about the hazards, about the water quality, about the business patterns, about whatever the topic is. Uh, but it's a nice intro to all of this without, okay, you've got to learn how to build a geodatabase with a feature class and, you know, a subtype and a domain and all that kind of stuff. It is, it is very accessible and uh, gets people thinking about, yeah, okay, I, I get it. And now I'm ready to go further. And then there's other uh, lessons in the same uh, library as well. Awesome. Joseph, uh, thank you for taking all those questions. I'm going to turn it to Jim now. Okay. okay. You bet. So, um, uh, thank you. Uh, just great um, gratitude for this tremendous uh, talk. Um, just you live and breathe GIS, and we can feel that coming from you. Um, I, I, before I finish up entirely, I want to acknowledge um, our Dean of Business, uh, Tom Haran, and also the director of the Center for Spatial Studies, uh, Steve Moore. Uh, Steve was here tonight. I don't think uh, Tom could make it, but I want to acknowledge their support for GIS at the university. Um, also, I want to acknowledge our center graduate assistant, Zeb Khan, uh, Julia Eastley, the executive assistant in the dean's office of our school, uh, and of course, um, Luis Garcia, uh, our tremendous audiovisual services manager. Um, and uh, my colleague, uh, Abhijit Sarkar. Um, we acknowledge this tremendous talk. We have a little something on the way to you in Colorado, and you'll be receiving it. Um, uh, we're sending it all the way across the country to you. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, insightful, an outstanding talk. GIS is a topic of huge and growing interest to business schools nationally and globally. And you've helped us think about this and, and, and get new ideas for it. Um, also, thanks to all of you who have attended the event and for the many, many thoughtful questions and discussion. Uh, it was lively discussion, that's for sure. 
Um, a video and story map of this talk will be available soon through the website of the Center for Spatial Business. Uh, Joseph has kindly agreed to uh, let us uh, post them there. We hope you can attend the upcoming Center speaker event on February 10th, the panel related to uh, the potential of marketing using GIS. Uh, we also plan a, another uh, final talk of the academic season uh, in, in late February, I mean, in late February, early March. So again, uh, Joseph, um, many, many thanks uh, for this tremendous uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank Keep you. up the good work. Map on and be spatial. <laughs>